As Ambassador of Mexico in Germany, I am pleased to welcome you to the Mexican Science Day within the Berlin Science Week 2020. Three years ago, the Embassy of Mexico decided to join the Berlin Science Week as we believe it to be an ideal framework for presenting and promoting scientific cooperation initiatives between Mexico and Germany. This is indeed an excellent opportunity to share with a specialized and non-specialized community the developments of our robust and mature relation in science, technology, and education. Moreover, it provides a platform in which scientists themselves take the lead and share with a wider audience their expertise. It is indeed those who spend hours in laboratories, libraries, and classrooms, the ones that can better explain their work, challenges, and achievements to all those interested, including not only scientists and students. In 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic has imposed an extraordinary challenge to humankind. It is now the most challenging task for governments and the international community. The pandemic has shown that we cannot confront it without scientific to and means. We cannot confront it without international cooperation either. As important as political cooperation, we fundamentally need scientific and technical cooperation. And on this specific matter, Mexico and Germany are partners in such a demanding endeavor. Due to the measures against the COVID-19 spreading, we cannot welcome you this time in our embassy. The Berlin Science Week is convening mainly virtually. In this opportunity, being a germ marked by a threat to global health, we have aimed to highlight the work of experts working in German institutions in that field. Let me thank the speakers for their interest in participating in this session. I also thank the representatives of the scientific institutions who prepared messages for the opening of our Berlin Science Week event. The efforts of your organizations are key for our country's fruitful cooperation. I thank you very much for taking part in the Mexican Science Day 2020. We hope to see you again in the coming years. I thank you very much. Dear ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to send a welcoming address on behalf of the Helmholtz Association in the context of the Mexican Science Day as part of the Berlin Science Week 2020. The mission of the Helmholtz Association is to contribute to solving the pressing issues of society, science and the economy through system-oriented, cutting-edge research. Major social challenges such as climate change or the energy supply of the future are of major international relevance. They can only be addressed globally through long-term engagement and the coordinated and systematic use of resources. We can find solutions to the great challenges of our time if we work together across national borders. The internationalization strategy of the Helmholtz Association is thus closely linked to the strategy of our federal government. Our goal as a research organization is to particularly focus on science diplomacy and to stand up for values such as scientific freedom. Another important goal is to establish and maintain strategic partnerships with excellent international partners. Finally, talent management, as well as a lively international exchange between young scientists are of central importance for the success of our work. Mexico is an international partner for the Helmholtz Association among the countries in North and South America, it ranks third as country of origin of our international guest scientists. What is more, numerous Helmholtz research centers in the research fields of health, earth and environment, and aviation, space and transport have a long-standing history of close and successful collaborations with Mexican partner organizations. I would like to highlight just a few of them. 
The Hamel Center Munich German Center for Environmental Health cooperates with the Infectology Hospital in Mexico City, the Tecnológico de Monterrey, the Centro de Biotecnología Genómica, and the Universidad Autónoma de Tamaulipas in Reynosa. Maria Elena Torres Padilla from the Institute of Epigenetics and Stem Cells of the Hemmel Center Munich will be giving a lecture today that I am very much looking forward to. The Magnesium Innovation Center of the Hemmel Center Geesthacht is currently exploring collaboration opportunities with the Universidad de Tecnológico de Monterrey for student and staff exchange in the fields of manufacturing engineering and lightweight construction. Last but not least, together with the European Space Agency, the German Aerospace Center DLR works closely together with authorities and research institutions in Mexico. Together, they have set up a data receiving station in Tetumal on the Yucatan Peninsula. With this system, information sent by satellites can be received and evaluated. This technology contributes to environmental protection in Mexico and the neighboring countries. In addition, in the event of natural disasters, such as fires or floods, action can be taken more quickly and in a more targeted manner. All this example shows that Germany and Mexico, the Helmholtz Association and Mexico, collaborate in a wide range of research fields and topics. Nevertheless, we are very much interested in not just continuing our close collaboration, but developing it further. With this in mind, I wish all of us and all of you a couple of hours filled with exciting lectures, interesting insights and stimulating discussions. Thank you very much. Dear Ambassador Gran Guillaume, dear Dr. Alvarez Builla, dear speakers, panelists, colleagues, dear friends of the German-Mexican Science Corporation, I would like to address a very warm welcome from the side of the DFG to all participants of this distinguished Mexican Science Day, which in this year is dedicated to health research. Mexico is one of our key countries in the cooperation with Latin America and since many years CONACYT is our central partner organization in Mexico. Especially in the cooperation within so-called coordinated interdisciplinary projects, Mexico was the first country in Latin America with whom such large-scale projects have been established. Health research has become so visible in recent months and in the context of the pandemic, never before has it been so much at the heart of society and never before has it been so effective as a compass for political decisions. However, the great importance and attention that health research is receiving these days also brings in a new responsibility that currently weighs on the researchers. COVID-19 is still a diverse field of research with many unknown aspects, although many has been found out so far. From this, I think two things can be derived in principle. The first, how important basic research is. And the second, how important cooperation in science is nationally and internationally. The importance of long-term work on a wide range of health research work was already evident in the comparatively rapid worldwide success in understanding topics such as COVID-19, which was only possible because of the funding of basic research has enabled scientists since the 1960s to continuously work on coronaviruses. This shows that basic research work with a broad disciplinary and thematic approach provides an indispensable extensive store of knowledge, which at least creates the base for later applications. In our bilateral research funding cooperation, we have funded many German-Mexican basic research projects in almost all research fields during the last years. And with this, the involved researchers have significantly contributed to this store of knowledge. Part of these projects have been funded, of course, together with CONACYT and also in the area of health research, such as a so-called research unit with a specific focus on neuroscience. 
With this, I would like to thank CONACYT and I would like to thank the Mexican Embassy for the long-standing cooperation and I wish all of us an interesting and successful day of Mexican science. Hello, my name is Christian Müller. I am Deputy Secretary General of DARD, the German Academic Exchange Service. Uh, on behalf of the DRD, the idea would like to remind that we as German universities and as DRD, we maintain very strong relations to Mexico, to Mexican universities, to Mex Mexican research institutes. Uh, they are large programs of exchange for students, for graduates, for scientists as well, and uh, scientific research cooperation programs which we fund and which we support since many years. And that's a very successful story over, over the last uh, decades, I would say. Um, I do remember very vividly my last trip to Mexico, which was in fact in February of this year, pretty much uh, very few days before the outbreak of the corona pandemia. And that was a very intensive and very successful trip we did from Mexico to Querétaro to San Luis Potosí. And we have seen a lot of very good institutions, scientific organizations. We have met many scientists and many students as well. That was a new format of information visit, I could say, for German universities of applied sciences. And we do have seen, we have seen a lot of opportunities of options for further cooperation for this specific kind of universities, which uh, we do have in Germany since 50 years or so. So that was a specific impression I took with me of our last visit to Mexico. So I'm looking forward uh, to this very specific event during the Berlin Science Week, an event which is uh, suggested and proposed by the Mexican Embassy in Berlin. We are very happy to have Dr. Julieta Rojo as a scientific advisor to the ambassador in Berlin. She herself is a DOD alumni and she has been to Germany many times and we are very happy to have her here in Berlin to be a strong linkage between uh, the Mexican scientific community, the Mexican government and German institutions. So on behalf of DOD, I wish to uh, give my warm regards to this event, to this specific afternoon between Mexico and Germany. Looking forward to the important discussions you are going to have, mainly uh, focusing on those specific uh, themes and, and items which are now so, now so important, which is uh, the biomedical research and questions related to molecular biology. This is very important for us all. And we all know that international cooperation in research is the main hope we do have to defeat this pandemia. Thank you very much. And I wish you a very important and interesting afternoon. Thank you. Buenas tardes a todas y a todos. Expreso mi mayor gratitud por invitarme como directora general del Consejo Nacional de Ciencia y Tecnología de México a participar en el Día de la Ciencia Mexicana, México en la Investigación Médica Alemana, en el marco de la Semana de la Ciencia en Berlín. Todos los ponentes que vamos a escuchar, grandes eh, líderes en sus áreas de investigación biomédica, y estoy segura que va a ser una enriquecedora reunión con muchos aportes científicos. En este sentido, la investigación en virología e inmunología se ha convertido en una prioridad para la seguridad nacional, igual que ha ocurrido en otros países del planeta. Por lo mismo, también hemos iniciado contactos de cooperación con distintas organizaciones e instituciones de Alemania para crear en México el primer Instituto Nacional de Virología, Enfermedades Emergentes y Tropicales. Con este objetivo, consideramos de vital importancia fortalecer los lazos de cooperación internacional con países como Alemania para juntos llevar a cabo este tipo de proyectos ambiciosos que incluye, entre otras cosas, la implementación de programas de formación para nuevas y nuevos virólogos 
así como becas de movilidad y de intercambio de capacidades entre nuestros países. Para finalizar, quiero agradecer a nombre del Gobierno de México y del propio Consejo Nacional de Ciencia y Tecnología el gran honor que nos brinda el gobierno alemán y la ciudad de Berlín al celebrar el Día Nacional de la Ciencia Mexicana dentro de la Semana de la Ciencia de Berlín. Estamos convencidas y convencidos que esta ocasión afortunada nos permitirá fortalecer la cooperación entre ambos países. Muchísimas gracias y pues les mando un abrazo y que sea una exitosísima reunión. Hello everybody. I want first to present myself. My name is Julieta Rojo and I am the scientific attaché of the Mexican Embassy in, in Berlin. I have the pleasure to coordinate this important session today called the Mexican Science Day in the frame of the Berlin Science Week. In this point, I want to welcome everybody in Mexico in, in the morning and in Germany in this afternoon. Uh, we will have a brilliant presentation of experts in Germany from different institutions. And if you allow me, I want to start with our program today that is very rich, introducing Professor Dr. Aaron Borgonio. Professor Borgonio is the sub-coordinator of the cardiovascular research program of the Heart Center of the University Clinic of Cologne. He graduated from the University of Mexico and has a master degree in biomedical science of the University of Mexico and also a PhD of, in pharmacology with magna cum laude at the University of Heidelberg under and with support with the so-called DAAD scholarship Nowadays, he is internist cardiologist from the University of Heidelberg and member of the German Academy of Intermedicine and Cardi Cardiology. Since 2017, he is working at the, in clinic and basic cardiovascular research at the Heart Center at the University of Cologne. The title of his lecture is Nitric Oxide and Cardiovascular Diseases. Professor Borgonio, please, you are very welcome to this session. Uh, thanks very much, Violeta. Thanks very much for everything. Well, um, I will speak in a short time for a very big subject. And my subject this time is the, uh, the nitric oxide and cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease are the leading cause of death globally. In 2017, more than 70 million people died. It's the number one cause of death, both men and women. In fact, more women die of heart disease globally each year more than men. At the center of cardiovascular, uh, cardiovascular system is the heart. Cardiovascular disease affect not only uh, the heart, but also the miles of blood vessels throughout the body. In 1980, Eight, the Nobel Prize in Medicine was for the discovery of a molecule produced not only in the line of the blood vessels that keeps them free of plaque. This miracle molecule has been the topic of more than 20,000 medical studies since 1980s. The molecule is nitric oxide. Here will we call it like NO as a molecule that is present in human systems, but particularly in the cardiovascular system. And so what, why is important this molecule? What does that mean? The medical benefits of this discovery can be summed at, the time, at that time in less cardiovascular disease. Uh, nitric oxide is a very important gas that is produced by cells throughout the body. It's a free radical cellular messengers generated by three different isoforms for of nitric oxide synthesis, neuronal, inducible, and endothelial. NO plays an important role in the protections against the onset and progression of cardiovascular disease. 
These are associated with a number of different disorders, including hypercholesterolemia, hypertension, and diabetes. The underlying on pathology of for most cardiovascular disease is atherosclerosis, which is turn associated with endothelial dysfunctional. We know now that when plaques become large and breathed, can crack and rupture the crack like an other cut in the body, clots to stop the bleeding. However, when a clot occurs in the arteries, the results can be catastrophic. We know now that the body is capable of healing cells, damage and blocked vessels can open up and function normally again without drugs or surgery. So this is a normal physiology process. The cardioprotective cardio, uh, roles of NO includes regulation of blood pressure and vascular tone, but even to the inhibition of platelets aggregation and leukocytes addition and prevention of small muscle cell proliferations. But we have a small problem. The issue is that nitric oxide has a very short half-life. It only, it only remains in the body for a few seconds. It's a free radical species and is a rapid broken down. And so one of the problems in translation to the clinic has been how to deliver nitric oxide therapeutics over a long term or more chronic basis. In recent years, it was demonstrated that nitric oxide, though it's a short half life, is actually rapidly broken down into a molecule called nitrates, NO2. And nitrates appear to be a very stable storage molecule that can be converted back into NO during conditions of hypoxia of ischemia, such as might happen during a head attack or stroke. And now scientists are really investigating how we can harness the use of nitrate to deliver NO during cardiovascular disease and a number of other diseases. At the same time, of interest is the idea that green vegetables that had been thought to be healthy for many years actually contain levels of nitrate and nitrate NO2 and NO3 and NO3 can be converted back into NO2 and then into nitric oxide. Now we have a way that we can modify our diet in a healthy manner. It's also interesting to note that people that have disease, cardiovascular disease and other disease have very low levels of nitrate and nitrate and nitrate in their bodies. And so these back to questions Will we improve their healthy by increasing the amount of nitrate in their diet? This subject is actually really controversial. I told you before that NO has a very hard life in the body and many of its very powerful protective effects are difficult to harness without NO-based drugs. However, scientists discovered that NO is actually broken down into NO2 and NO2 is incredibly stable in the body. It sticks around for a long period of time. And this is very good for us and for our investigations. However, when the body suffers low blood flu or hypoxia or some disease states, NO2 is rapidly converted in, into nitric oxide. And this nitric oxide can then exert beneficial effects like dilated blood vessels, improved blood flow, and alleviate the low blood flu or the hypoxic conditions. And thus could be life-saving. And this is a very good example of homeostasis. Since nitrate NO2 has emerged, and now it's a um, very, very important method to increase world body nitric oxide levels. A number of scientists in different countries have been trying to harness this molecule in a number of ways and to study the use of nitrate, give orally or by injections. Actually, in our laboratory, we are looking to perform clinical trials to give injected versions of sodium nitrate, and thus nitrate can be converted to nitric oxide and protect the heart or the brain against stroke or attacks or attack situations. We work with animals and humans models as well but it's not too easy to translate the results or some results in a clinical practice life. 
I will not speak here about the interesting and complexity molecular pathway of nitric oxide. I will only describe the several alternatives that we use to the strategies to increase nitric oxide signaling in cardiovascular disease. Who have recently emerged with promising therapeutic potential because traditional ways of increasing NO levels like a natural glycerin or the organic nitrates have limited utility, mainly owing unfavorable pharmacokinetics and the development of the tolerance. So these strategies include the identification of novel pathways for enhancing NOS activity, the amplification of nitrate and nitrate, NO2 and NO3 nitric oxide pathway, and also the novel classes of nitric oxide donating drugs that limit NO metabolisms using reactive oxygen species. And of course, the modulation of downstream phosphodiesterases and soluble one LLC classes. Um, in the laboratory, we use also the call it NO, NO8, and this is a molecule and complex NO metal complex such and sodium nitroposiate. Uh, there is another strategy that they're used in, um, in another forms, not only the cardi cardiovascular systems. Um, at, for example, the use about the anti-inflammatory drugs, not steroidal, who provides a sensible platform for no donors carrying drug development. But these questions about the delivery remain even though. And finally, I make a short summary in four points. The role of NO in the cardiovascular systems has been extensively studied with a protective role being attributed to nitric oxide in arterial hypertony, arterial sclerosis, coronary artery disease, and thrombolic, thromboembolic disease. Thus, the endothelial dysfunction characterized by the lower production and or bioavailability of nitric oxide is one of the factors that contribute to the genesis of the cardiovascular disease. Although it is unclear whether this is a cause of or result of endothelial dysfunction. Disturbance in NO bioavailability leads to a loss of the cardioprotective actions, and in some cases may even increase these progressions, so like in a cancer. Last but not least, the inflammation and oxidative stress are strong strikers of endothelial dysfunction, and this is important to recognize. Scientists from diverse backgrounds continue to reveal unexpected discoveries to nitric oxide regulation that will like have positive implications for human health and disease. A majority of research finding in on all in nitric oxide signaling have been confirmed in male rodents and large mammals. But it's important to say that more of these studies have been affected in cell cultures and different animals models, but remain to prove in clinical trials. And that's, that's what I do here in our laboratory. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor Borgonio, for your presentation. We learned a lot more from your head, from your center in Cologne. It was a great effort, I noticed it. So let's let's see after the all presentations, what can you explain us from your experiences in Germany? The next speaker is Professor Dr. Marielena Torres Padilla, uh, that I have also the honor to present. Uh, Professor Marielena Torres Padilla is also from Mexico, full professor at the University of München and director of the Institute of Epigenetics and Stem Cells at the Helmholtz Centrum München. After her studies of biology at the University, National University of Mexico, she received a doctoral degree from the University of Paris in the Institut Pasteur. She completed postdoc studies at the University of Cambridge and, and the um, uh, Institute 
of Molecular Biology in Strasbourg. She is a member of the European Molecular Biology Organization and has authored more than 75 publications. Thank you very much, Julieta. I will share the screen. Very good. So, um, yeah, hello everyone. And um, I really want to thank Julieta Rojo and all the team at the embassy for inviting me to discuss with you today about what is epigenetics. Um, so I thought that I could um, try to lead you to a little bit of a tour of a word that you have probably heard and maybe you don't know exactly what it can mean. And um, I will try to discuss with you towards the end why do we care or what does it matter? And also to explain you uh, the context of this um, epigenetics in terms of what the research that we do at the Institute of Epigenetics and Stem Cells at the Helmholtz Center in Munich is. And so I thought that I could make a very small reminder of where the world comes from, really a, a very basic thought, if, if you wish. And so I just wanted to remind you that etymologically, the word epigenetics comes from the Greek. And the first part of the word comes from epi, so epi, which is actually translated in, in English as above or on top of. And obviously genetics, and genetics is what relates to genes. So if you put these two things together, what this basically means is what is on top of the genes. So this is what I will try to discuss with you today, and hopefully um, I will get you excited about what epigenetics can uh, be good for your life or not. Um, so this word has been around for many, many years, actually centuries, but it was it has regained interest in the um, in the last, I would say, 60, 70 years. And that is really um, due to the work of uh, the work of Conrad uh, Waddington in what we um, refer to as the Waddington's epigenetic landscape. And um, I think Waddington had really the um, idea or the work or the inspiration to take molecularly the word epigenetics and try to um, put a meaning of what that means. And so obviously Waddington started um, his uh, work in terms of development. And I will tell you a little bit of uh, what uh, development we do. I will not talk to you about what uh, Weddington um, uh, was doing in terms of development. But what he proposed is that uh, perhaps there's a little cell here, which is uh, this little sphere. And over time, depending on how the epigenetic program of that cell could be uh, unfolded, that could give rise to different developmental programs. I don't necessarily want to use a lot of technical words today, but I will try to explain you what this means in, in, in really very simple kind of concrete, hopefully very thoughtful um, way with you today. Okay, so um, if you actually just look at your bodies, you can see that there's a lot of diversity um, and our bodies are composed of all these many, many different cells that you see here. And I think what is fascinating is that each of these cells although they have this exactly genetic material across, they perform very different functions. And um, you can see, of course, this is the, the, the um, drawing of 23 chromosomes. But as I said, each of the cells of your body presents a completely different function. The liver cell is doing one thing, the skin cell is one do doing another thing. So if we go back in time, back really, really back in time, when at least I was much younger, and uh, back into the, um, obviously, I mean, this is a, a human embryo in this case. What I think is fascinating to remember is that your genetic load is set at day zero as fertilization with the mother, the oocyte here, and the sperm. Uh, and so I think, as I said, the fascinating question is how this single molecule of DNA that you're seeing here um, is set at day zero and how it actually functions. Uh, actually, molecular is very simple. What you do is to read this DNA, in this case, by generating this molecule right here, um, which is messenger RNA. And now this messenger RNA, as I said, is reading the information on the DNA to make proteins. And I guess this is very simple and this is understood of all of us. But of course, this RNA is not generated randomly in our, our cells, but it really depends on how the DNA is open. The DNA is actually packed 
across um, this uh, histone. So this represents one of them, the histone proteins. And together with the DNA, these histones represent the chromatin. And um, this chromatin folds into actually a very complicated uh, patterns up to the way to have them very, very compacted, as you can see here. So the DNA here is rather compacted uh, to form the typical chromosomes that we have all studied in uh, primary school and that we have all seen uh, in drawings of, of the cells. And so the question is how this packing, which is essential, um, is, is functioning. Now, I will come to this a little bit um, later and give you a little bit more details on that. Uh, but this is an essential what epigenetics does. It helps us to understand how this packing helps our genome to function. And why is that important? Well, many reasons. So there are these chemical groups that you're seeing here in, um, in red and in green that can be influenced by the environment. They can come from your food or from when your mother was pregnant with you that can actually mani manipulate the um, accessibility of the information in the DNA. And in general terms, well, this is all great because we developed into most of us normal beings, but sometimes these things can go wrong. And when I mean that this can go wrong is basically, for example, instead of the red is a green, and that basically means for on expression or off expression of genes. And this is um, really um, changing in, in um, disease. So when did all of start? So as I said to you, the cells in the embryo start interpreting this epigenetic code from the very beginning. And what I think is fascinating is that if you look at this very early embryo here, cells are actually capable to do all the cells in your body. So that means that uh, these cells have actually not quite decided where they are going, so which fate they are acquiring, and they have a tremendous plasticity to actually generate different cells. And this is actually happening before the embryo implants in the womb. The cells can do any type of the cell in the body. And of course, this is actually quite remarkable because as I said at the beginning, um, you will know that we have different cell types. The neurons do exact, completely different uh, functions and a liver cell that does your metabolism and the blood. So these cells that have all this capacity are called stem cells, so stem cells that can generate all these tissues. And the DNA content of these cells and these cells is exactly the same, I told you. So that also actually means that we can reprogram these cells back just by changing their epigenome. We do not have to change the genome. We only need to manipulate the epigenome in order to revert this cell fate. And you could understand that in terms of um, cell repair and regeneration, this is an amazing opportunity. So if we understand how we can manipulate these little chemical groups that I discussed to you, that, that I discussed with you earlier, we can do a lot. So for example, we can cure epigenetically. Um, I told you a little bit about reprogramming, what we can do with reprogramming, but also we can use epi drugs. And some of them are, for example, already used to treat cancer in which um, the genes that are the oncogenes that are drivers of cancer and transformation can be modulated through the action of epidrugs. So it is important. And um, a little sort of teaser of what I'm telling you is that you are not what your genes are. Uh, and that just tells you that, I mean, for many years when um, genetics came into action at the beginning of last century, the people say, well, you know, I am completely predetermined by my genome. And that actually also raised a number of questions um, in terms of society and, and ethics, whether well, we are completely determined from the day zero, as I told you. But actually not quiet, because um, epigenetics explains you that the genome is flexible. And um, is flexible, it can go beyond your genes. Obviously, it needs your genes to function but it's flexible in the sense um, with a very simple example I told you is that the cells in our body are truly exquisite in terms of function, yet they have exactly the same genetic material. So how does this actually work? So remember just to um, a little bit wrap up what I told you so far, I told you about the Waddington's epigenetic landscape and then you can see this little cell as the one cell baby or embryo that we all were. And the end points would be, for example, the um, cell in the liver or the cell in the skin. So why um, uh, is this exciting and how does this work? 
Um, so I thought I thought I could uh, give you a little bit more precision of this. So if I um, recap what I've told you, what is epigenetics? Well, is the information that is somehow independent of the DNA sequence, um, but this information regulates um, how our DNA is read, and therefore it regulates all the downstream events, such as gene expression, and it is heritable. In other words, a cell that has decided to go into the liver path will be a liver path. Um, as a neuron then will be a neuron on pretty much for the rest of its life on, unless we do something to it. Now, how does it work? Mostly through small biochemical modifications, as I depicted already, on our DNA or our epigenome on the chromatin. And I will give you a little bit of an example on this, a little bit more. Uh, but really, in a sense, epigenetics is what makes our body function and what actually makes our body at all, because we could not generate all these cells if we couldn't be able to have a flexible epigenome. Um, and so in, in a sense, um, really, I think it's um, exciting to think that every DNA-based process um, takes place in chromatin. And so this is again a little cartoon of what I showed you. So this is the cell uh, nucleus in, in, in our cells or in any, any eukaryotic cell. And that is the chromatin that I already showed you in, in the video that is highly packed. And then now we go in the opposite direction, then we go through levels of regulation where eventually the DNA is more accessible. Um, and as I told you at the beginning, the DNA sequence is really the genetic information and uh, how this is wrapped around the histone is what is important. And so why it is this actually working this way? So what I uh, simplify here is this nucleosomes. It, this is the combination of the four different histones that we have plus the DNA. And these histones have extended tail on the um, uh, N-terminal part of the histone. So this is a, a protein. And these tails can actually have um, several chemical modifications, uh, histone modifications. And that basically means that we have epigenetic writers or modifying enzymes. But we also have epigenetic erasers, so the enzymes that could remove these modifications here, for example. And so we also have um, a number of proteins that can read um, these different uh, modifications. So this is, for example, a, a green uh, here. And this, the reader, is actually what would determine the function. So a green reader here, which I'm obviously simplifying, would be promoting the gene that has this specific histone in there. And um, as you by the city of Mayas Lab, there are um, a lot of very good. So why do we care? And this is my last slide. I have two examples because it allows us, for example, to adapt to stress. Very quick example, this is um, an ant, uh, Camponotus floridanos, that has two different workers. This is a major worker. The minor worker is actually what um, does most of the work. And um, they are different, yet the DNA is identical. These um, ants have been actually experimentally produced in the lab by changing the diet, by manipulating the histone acetylation groups. So you can actually change behavior and morphology through manipulating the epigenome. And the second part, which I think is important, is that epigenetics allows us to generate diversity. In this case, for example, in the crops. So you know that because of domestication, the crops, um, the genetic diversity of the crops has been reduced over the last um, 200 years. And we can actually use epigenetics to create phenotypic diversity to adjust, to adapt to stress. And this is particularly relevant in the um, context of current climate change. So it is important, and I will leave you with that. Um, I hope that I was able to discuss at least some concept on epigenetics and that I got you excited about it. And please feel free to contact me if you are excited about this. Thank you. Professor Torres Padilla, thank you very much for this so clearly presentation. It is very, very, interesting and it was very, very clear. We give the venue to Dr. Marcel Prax. Uh, Dr. Prax, you're very welcome today in this, in this uh, session. 
And I want to say that Dr. Pras is head of the laboratory of the section of microbiological safety from the Paul Ehrlich Institute. He studied biology followed by a PhD in microbiology since 2015. He is now head of laboratory of the section microbiological safety at the Paul Ehrlich Institute. He is particularly interested in the characterization of bacterial strains and their physiological behavior and blood components. He has been involved in the establishment of bacterial reference strain for, for both platelet and red blood cell concentrates and coordinates international studies including Mexico to develop strategies that can be applied to increase the safety of blood transfusion worldwide. The title of his lecture is Blood Safety in Multicentric Study. You're very welcome. Please, Dr. Platt, we hear you. Thank you a lot, uh, Dr. Julieta Orojo. And um, yeah, thanks for the organizers for the invitation to give a presentation on our study, which we performed. Um, I hope you can see the screen now. Yeah, so I extended the title a little bit because, yeah, we performed a multicentric study, but this study was part of a project in which we wanted to establish bacteria reference strains for red blood cell components. And Dr. Julieta Rojo and her team, they were involved as a Mexican study partner here in this study. And I would like to uh, give you some insights how such reference materials are established, why they are needed, especially also for blood components. And of course, I will then focus on the second half of my talk also on the study itself and uh, what was the result of the study. So um, I'm working at the Paul Ehrlich Institute and uh, the Paul Ehrlich Institute is the Federal Institute for Vaccines and Biomedicines in Germany. And we assess the quality of biomedicines for human use, but also for the veter veterinary use. Our main task is the authorization, but also the experimental batch release of different medicinal products like vaccines, immunoglobulins, but also innovative products like gene therapeutics. And a third big group is our tissue or tissue preparations, but also blood products. The Paul Ehrlich Institute is also part of the WHO uh, network, the so-called co collaborating centers. We have two collaborating centers at the Paul Ehrlich Institute, one for vaccines and the other one for blood products and IVD devices. And the role of those collaborating centers or of this whole network is to support the WHO in different tasks. And one core function of these centers is the contribution to the establishment of reference materials, but also international standards. And uh, yeah, before I will continue, I would first like to give you a kind of definition of uh, an international reference material. So what kind of criteria has a substance to fulfill in order to be called reference material? Such materials or substances, they have to be stable with respect mm -hmm. to their properties, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is for its intended use. And it's also important that they are well characterized and most of the cases also of known composition. And very important, they have to have shown their suitability in a broad variety of methods or applications. And this is also the reason in our case why we performed this collaborative study in order to cover this aspect. Uh, as soon as a reference material is, is, is established, it can be used for a lot of different uh, yeah, purposes. For example, to validate uh, analytical measurement methods, you can calibrate instruments with it. You can also use it to ensure the reliability of your diagnostic procedures and to standardize diagnostic procedures in general. So it, it can help you, for example, to uh, compare and assess different assays from different manufacturers and to determine, for example, the, sensit the, the sensitivity of an assay. So they are really, these are really important for the quality of a lot of different measurements and diagnostics. So, but why do we need actually bacterial reference strains for blood products? Um, worldwide, we have more than 100 million blood donations per year. And from these blood donations, 
The major components which are produced out of it are plasma, platelets, and red blood cells. These are used, for example, for patients who are suffering from bleeding disorders or also during surgery or cancer treatments. And of course, blood is donated by uh, human healthy people, but there is always a risk that blood components are contaminated with bacteria during the blood donate donation process. And why is this the case? So in order to, uh, to, to, to um, get the blood, you of course have to venipuncture the skin like here. And the skin is a natural source of bacteria. The skin is not sterile. So we have a lot of bacteria which are living on our skin. And even though the skin is disinfected before the venipuncture, uh, this, it, there is a, uh, always a, a risk that some of the bacteria survive this treatment and that in the end can enter the blood collection bag. There are minor sources of bacteria, also bacteremia. That means that people have uh, a bloodstream infection, but this is really rare. And what's also very rare is that, for example, plastic devices or other devices are contaminated. But the major source is really the skin of the, um, of the donors. And here you can see an example of a, of a contaminated platelet concentrate. Here you can see that the bacteria, they lead to really an aggregation of the platelets and also form a biofilm. So this is a really an obvious contamination, which will hopefully be not transfused. But often you cannot see such contaminations like this, but um, yeah, they are often yeah, not visible for even for a very um, experienced people in this field. The prevalence, so the frequency of bacterial contaminations, it varies uh, and you find different numbers in the literature, but it's around 0 0.01, 0 0.2% for the platelet units and even lower for the red blood cell concentrates. But uh, when you compare it to the huge numbers of blood donations, then even these small percentage of contamination are 10,000 of contaminated blood components worldwide. And the problem with those contaminated blood components is that when you transfuse them, they can lead to really severe reactions in the recipients. This can range from mild fever or chill reactions up to hypotension or septic shock. And of course, the worst case, the worst case scenario is that the recipient uh, yeah, dies in the end due to the contamination. Uh, fortunately, we have, there are measures to increase the blood safety to prevent the transfusion of bacteria. One approach is, which is used by blood establishment is that they are screening for bacterial contaminations. Here at, in this approach, you take samples from the blood bag and you incubate it in medium and you let bacteria which are inside, they can grow, they produce CO2 due to the metabolism. And these automated blood culture systems, they can detect the production of CO2 and with this also the um, presence of bacteria. A second approach is, and this is more a proactive approach, which is more and more in common, is the use of so-called pathogen reduction methods. These are devices which are using energy-rich UV light to kill bacteria. Now, both approaches, of course, and all the devices which are used here, they have, of course, to show their efficiency also by an appropriate validation. And here, now our reference strains come into play. Because the problem is that blood in general is a very complex biological matrix. It consists not only of cells, but also of proteins, other components, which also have an antimicrobial property. And this leads that some of the bacteria are efficiently killed. Whereas other bacterial species or even isolates, they are quite well adapted to the blood and they can start to grow. And this is also shown here. Bacterial growth can vary significantly in blood. Some of the, the majority of the cells are killed by the, by the blood. So this is called autosterilization. Other bacteria, they persist, they do not die, but they also are not able to grow. And then the, there are a few bacterial isolates of species that are really able to grow to high concentrations within a really short range. And of course, these bacteria, they are a huge problem in the transfusion field. And when you want to validate now these systems here, of course, you need to use bacteria that 
of which you know that they are stable in blood, that hopefully also are able to grow, because these are the worst case scenarios. And we know that bacteria have such a huge var variability with respect to their phenotypes, that this was the reason why we wanted to establish reference strains which show reliable and robust growth in blood components. And for this, uh, I would like now to go through and to guide you through the uh, procedure how official reference material is produced. The first aspect, of course, is that there is an official demand of need of reference material. I think I made it clear in the, in the slide before that we really need uh, such kind of uh, strains. Then you submit a proposal to the WHE, WHO com uh, collaborative centers for establishment of such a material. And when they agree to it, then you can start to identify promising material. In our case, we collected bacteria from laboratories or blood establishments from the whole world. These bacteria were involved in transfusion incidents with red blood cells. What we did is we took the bacteria, we inoculated a small amount of bacteria in, a, in red blood cell units or in bags. This, this small amount is usually also the case in natural contaminations. Therefore, we always spike in a very low concentration. And then we start the red blood cell bags at four degrees. This is the normal storage conditions of those red blood cell bags. And then we determined the number of viable bacteria over time. And just as a summary, we tested in total 32 different bacterial strains. And surprisingly for us, only six out of these strains actually showed growth in red blood cell concentrates. So via this pretest, we had some promising candidates identified. And the next step was, of course, to characterize these candidate materials a little bit further. And just as an example, we performed further growth analysis. So we really inoculated red, red blood cell units with the different strains, three bags every for each strain. And we took samples on a daily basis. And you can see here that some of the strains really were able to grow to 10 to the power of nine bacteria per milliliter within two weeks, and this at four degrees. And the, new, the normal shelf life of red blood cells is 42 days. So you can see that uh, during this time, yeah, bacteria are, are really able to grow to uh, critical concentrations. So with this characterization, we were able to, again, verify our tests or our results from our pretest. And for the collaborative study and also to be established as, as reference material, we have to produce batches of these materials. So we um, yeah, have to produce a lot of vials of these bacteria, not only to send it to our study partners, but also after the establishment, customers can buy these materials and therefore we had to produce a big uh, huge batches of these materials. We also had to characterize them and, and so on. I will not go too much into detail here, but I will, would like to concentrate now on recruiting international laboratories for a collaborative study, because this is then uh, the real challenge for these strains to show that they are really good material. And here you can see uh, a map where the countries in which the study sites were located are labeled here in orange. And just in general, again, the purpose of such a collaborative study is really to demonstrate that the candidate materials is suitable for its intended use and that it's independent of um, several factors which can be uh, different in the different countries or also in the, in the laboratories. And here I highlighted the uh, Mexico because also the colleagues from the National Transfusion Center in Mexico, they participated in this study. And what I would also like to highlight is that it's not um, so, yeah, it's not so common that uh, laboratories from blood establishments participate in such a study. It's a challenge to recruit those laboratories, sorry. Um, and the WHO really, for the WHO, it's really important that there are enough laboratories involved in such a study uh, 
or from the six WHO regions because this is really crucial to have a very yeah, reliable result. But as I said, it's not so easy to recruit labs because of course you need the ability and knowledge in our case, for example, to handle potential infectious material because we send bacteria. You need to know how to handle bacteria. You also need a lot of time because the growth was uh, uh, more than six weeks. So it, it was a quite a long period, this study. Uh, often there are, are staff sh shortages and you need, of course, employees who have time to perform this kind of study. Then you need trained employees who also know, for example, how to work uh, under sterile conditions. You need a lot of material. Here's just an example on how many agar nutrient plates you need and everything just for, for the determination of colonies at one day. You need a, a facility where you are allowed to work with live bacteria. You need also ethical approval to use red blood cell bags, for example. And I think what, what is really important is that the, the team or the, the, uh, yeah, the, the study partner is really dedicated to this field and who wants to, to um, yeah, improve the quality of the, of the blood transfusion field. And not to forget, such a study has to be done additional to your routine work. Therefore, I'm really, really happy that colleagues from Mexico were able to participate, that they had the time and also the capacity to, um, yeah, to collaborate with us. Then, of course, you, during the recruiting time, you also have to finish the study design with uh, assistance of the WHO and other committees. This is just a short overview what the study part, what was the task of the study partners. So they received bacteria from us. They had to dilute this bacterial suspension also again to reach a final concentration of 10 to 25 bacteria. And these bacteria were then inoculated in red blood cell units. So these were these units were spiked, we call it spiking. And then these artificially contaminated units were stored at four degrees for six weeks and the collaborating partners then took samples on a weekly interval and they determined the number of viable bacteria over time. So this was just a rough summary of the, of the study outline. And of course, then the next step was then to perform the collaborative studies. And when they were finished, our partners, they sent us the data. We reviewed the data, we analyzed them. We also wrote a report, which was submitted to the expert committee on biological standardization. This is a committee which is um, uh, based on, or which is part of the WHO and they are evaluating the studies and they also um, yeah, endorse whether a material will be reference material or not. And just as an example here, I don't want to go too much into details, but uh, we tested six strains and five of the strains really showed good results. And just an example, here's Pseudomonas fluorescence. This strain was able to grow in all the different laboratories, which are here uh, shown in lines. Uh, this strain was really able to grow in all the different laboratories in, in all the three tested play, uh, red blood cell bags. But to our surprise, there was also one strain which totally failed in the study. The Zeratium assistance showed good growth in our lab, but as you can see here, in more than half of the other labs, this strain was not able to grow in any of the tested red blood cell concentrates. And I think this is, this is really a good example why reference materials or reference strains for blood components are necessary because you can really have diverse growth behaviors and, and um, yeah, of strains. And if you really want to validate your system, then of course you should really use a strain where you know this strain has a robust and, rel and reliable um, uh, properties and growth characteristics. And with this, yeah, I'm already almost finished. So we have now established five bacterial strains for the red blood cell concentrates, and we already perf have performed other studies before uh, in which we established other strains for the platelet concentrates. And I would, what I would like to highlight is also that in all the three studies, colleagues from the National Blood Transfusion Center in Mexico participated in these studies. And this is really great. It's a long collaboration. And um, yeah, I hope that we will continue this cooperation also in the future. 
And in my last slide, I would like to yeah, thank especially Professor Dr. Julieta Rojo and her whole team for their great contribution. I know that especially uh, Professor Julieta Rojo, is, she's very committed and she really is, um, yeah, will, she really likes to contribute to this uh, whole story. And we are currently also performing two additional international studies using these strains to evaluate different topics. I can't go in too much, or I will not go too much in details here, but for these studies, for example, we also gained a new partner from Mexico. It's Dr. Amalia Bravo Lindoro. She will participate now in these ongoing and also future studies, and I'm really happy to, to work with her. And yeah, in the end, I would like also, of course, thank all the other collaborating partners from the whole world. And of course, my colleagues from the sector microbial safety for the support in this, uh, I think, very, very important story. Yeah, and with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Dr. Dr. Marcel Prax, thank you very much for your words and for the presentation and for this important collaboration between Mexico and Germany. Thank you so much. Dr. Arrubio is a postdoctoral researcher uh, in the group of Professor Guillermo Barreto at the Max Planck Institute for Heart and Lung Research in collaboration with the Unit of Tissue Growth, Repair and Regeneration at the University of Paris, the UPEC code in France. Her research includes in vitro, in vivo, and ex vivo translational models oriented to link RNA epigenetic mechanisms in pulmonary fibrosis and lung cancer. As investigator of German clinical trial, EMOLANG, for non invasive lung cancer early diagnosis. Her scientific contributions have been recently awarded by the most important scientific and medical German societies. She already received in this year three important prizes for her work. The title of her lecture is What do we know about pulmonary fibrosis? Dr. Rubio, please. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carla Rubio. It's a pleasure for me to be part of this amazing panel. What do we know about pulmonary fibrosis? I will take this opportunity to talk about the project that we developed during my PhD at the Max Planck Institute for Heart and Lung Research under the supervision of Professor Guillermo Barreto, which highlights a mechanism of gene expression regulation in pulmonary fibrosis based on a nuclear microRNA. My talk is divided in the next three parts. I will start with a very brief introduction about uh, pulmonary fibrosis. And then I will go through the main results of our work in four different points. Finally, I would like to sum up these observations showing you the mechanistic model and the perspectives that are currently open in the field of pulmonary fibrosis. Pulmonary fibrosis represents the most common interstitial lung disease, affecting around 5 million people worldwide. Unfortunately, these numbers are rising due to increased lung injuries after exposure to air pollution, for example, a consequence of industrialization, but also due to aging populations. Patients have a maximal survival of three years and uh, the causes of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis are currently unresolved. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which I will refer to uh, in, the, in this presentation as IPF, using the abbreviation, is characterized by progressive scarring around the tiny sacs of the lungs, which are called alveoli. The causes um, the, the accumulation of fibroblasts in these regions of the lung causes them to get thick and stiff, which leads to dyspnea, hypoxemia, and ultimately to respiratory failure within three years. Even if the causes of IPF remain unresolved, several evidence supports uh, that 
alveolar type two cells are initially injured. And this, this event, the injury of 82 cells, as, as they are called, leads to the development of fibrotic foci, which largely consist of activated myofibroblasts. While under normal circumstances, these fibroblasts are important for wound healing and connective tissue production, inside the fibrotic foci, these myofibroblasts induce extracellular matrix protein deposition by TGF beta and FGF signaling pathway activation. The balance then between the transcription of lineage specific genes and the repression of pro-fibrotic genes is essential for both mechanisms, for the expansion of the so-called resting or quiescent fibroblast towards activated myofibroblast open a long injury by the activation of these mechanisms, as well as for the, the differentiation of the activated myofibroblast into resting fibroblast, therefore inducing the resolution of the fibrotic foci. This will be a homeostatic mechanism of normal lung repair, which is not occurring in pulmonary fibrosis. And for these mechanisms of uh, phenotyping changes in the myofibroblast, what is crucial is the transcriptional balance. Since Professor Torres Padilla already introduced us very nicely into the epigenetic regulators, I will just um, mention briefly that transcriptional regulation and transcriptional balance is closely linked to chromatin structure. Chromatin structure is the physiological template of all DNA dependent biological processes inside the nucleus of the cells. And this structure can be modulated at different levels by mechanisms involving covalent modification of nucleotides on DNA or post-translational histone modifications, as she explained in the histone tails, changes in nucleosome density or nucleosome deposition, changes in histone composition, or also due to the activity of non-histone proteins that are associated to chromatin or importantly to the action of non-coding RNAs, which are important for this talk. The majority of the eukaryote genome is transcribed into non-coding RNAs, approximately 95% of our genome. And these non-coding RNAs include the so-called microRNAs, which are around 22 nucleotides long, as well as the long non-coding RNAs. While microRNAs are assumed to act primarily in the cytosol, just uh, to inhibit the translation of the messenger RNAs, uh, long non-coding RNAs are located in both in the cytoplasm of the cells and in the nucleus. Nuclear long non-coding RNAs physically associate with chromatin remodeler complex, like the polycom repressor complex too. And therefore, they induce heterochromatin formation. They can also uh, serve as guides for specific genomic localizations, sequestration of transcription factors, or also inducing allosteric mechanisms for the scaffolding of tridimensional chromosomal structures. In the cytoplasm, the no long non-coding RNAs can stabilize, for example, certain messenger RNAs and blocking their translation, but they can also destabilize them and induce the decay of these uh, messenger RNAs. Furthermore, low non-coding RNAs also contain microRNA sequences and therefore can act as molecular sponges inhibiting the action of the microRNAs. On the other side, microRNAs have been associated to several human diseases, thereby being suggested as important diagnostic markers. Increasing evidence has shown the presence of this kind of uh, molecules, the microRNAs in the nucleus of the cells, but the functions are still not clarified. In this project, we were focusing in the microRNA mirlet 7 d or as it's known also, let 7 d which was the first known human microRNA. It's 22 nucleotides long, and this family, the, the members of the Midlet 7 family, are highly conserved across species in sequence, but also in function. 
The misregulation of LED7D leads to a less differentiated cellular, cellular states. And this is, for example, related to diseases like cancer. Previous groups have shown that midlet 7 d is a key regulatory microRNA, which is down-regulated in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Mechanistically, transforming growth factor beta, which we see here is a cytokine that is uh, permanently active in pulmonary fibrosis, down-regulates the expression of midlet 7 d by direct binding of the protein SMAT3 in the promoter of the precursor of let 7 d thereby inhibiting the transcription. The inhibition of mid let 7 d transcription caused an increase in mesenchymal markers in epithelial cells, and this also compromises the pulmonary function. Our group uh, early in 2017 observed and confirmed by different experimental approaches, the unconventional nuclear presence of mature let 7 d in the nucleus of cells derived from mouse lungs. And importantly, this location was identified in a specific nuclear subcompartments. This preliminary observation of the mature microRNA in the nucleus led to the to very important questions. What is the role of a nuclear microRNA in the nucleus? What are the intranuclear targets? Is this microRNA associated to nuclear proteins? Do they form functional complexes? Is this localization in a specific nuclear subcompartment? Is this a conserved mechanism among species? And what is the physiological relevance of a nuclear microRNA? In order to answer these questions, we performed different experimental approaches. And in 2018, we published the characterization of a multi-component RNA protein complex, which we called the MICE complex, because of the elements that are uh, contained in this complex, mirlet 7 d C1D, exos 10 and S2. So this is a RNA protein complex that I will explain uh, briefly what is the function. We demonstrated that this, this complex uh, regulates not only epigenetic silencing, but also nuclear organization. And how, so briefly, the microRNA lone non-coding RNA duplexes are further bound by the protein C1D, which in turn targets the RNA degradation complex, the exosome complex, and this is the nuclear specific subunit. And on the other side, the polycom repressive complex, as we see here, the catalytic subunit S2. And this recruitment takes place in bidirectional active loci. The exosome on one side induces the degradation of the non-coding RNAs, whereas the catalytic subunit of the polycom repressor 2 um, induces heterochromatin formation. The result of these two mechanisms, uh, non-coding RNA degradation and heterochromatin formation, is at the end transcriptional silencing. Then our hypothesis in order to characterize the biological relevance of this complex was that maybe the presence of a, this microRNA, which is downregulated in IPF, will also affect the um, epigenetic silencing mediated by the MyC complex in the fibroblast derived from IPF patients. And in order to, to um, analyze if this hypothesis was true, that the MyC complex has an effect on the conversion of the healthy fibroblast towards IPF fibroblast, we use several in vitro, in vivo, and ex vivo models. I will just uh, introduce you to you in the next four slides, some of the main results using this kind of experimental models. So the first step that we uh, performed was to analyze publicly available RNA sequen sequencing data from long patients that are controls or they are IPF. By analyzing this RNA sequencing data, we indeed observed that there are increased levels of conventional fibrotic markers, like fibronectin and collagens. But also interestingly, we observed the overexpression 
of the nuclear targets of led 7 d at least the targets that we were able to characterize in the mouse model. When we performed a keg enrichment, the Kyoto uh, Encyclopedia of Genes and Genome, we observed that these transcripts that are, are upregulated in, in IPF patients indeed are enriched in pathways that are um, correlated to extracellular matrix receptor interaction, focal addition, lysosome, seal addition. But for us, what was very interesting was to observe that the expression of these conventional IPF markers indeed positively correlate with the expression of midlet 7D targets. Uh, additional experimental approaches like expression analysis based on TACMAN assays and quantitative real-time PCR, we could also validate that in these patients, there is a down regulation of midlet 7D and there is an increase not only of the midlet 7D non-coding targets in the nucleus, but also an increase of the non-coding associated coding RNAs, so in the associated messenger RNAs. To understand how this dysregulation was taking place, then we performed some in silico analysis of these non-coding RNAs that we characterized as targets to identify midlet 7D target sites with a, with a, with a um, favorable minimum energy uh, values. And indeed, we observe that these non-coding RNAs all have the ability to directly interact with midlet 7D, but not, it was not the case for the associated coding RNAs. So it means that then midlet 7D might be creating RNA RNA duplexes in control patients but since in IPF patients, this microRNA is reduced, this duplex cannot be formed. But the next question is, if the microRNA can only bind the non-coding RNAs, but not the coding RNAs, how we see this increase in the coding RNAs? And for that, we performed chromatin immunoprecipitation assays, which means that we analyzed the promoter region of these genes, and indeed we observed that there is a decrease of the occupancy of the proteins that are present in the MYC complex. As we could see here, there is a significant reduction, not only of exos 10, but also exos 5, exos 1, and the catalytic subunit of the polycom repressor complex. We also could observe a decrease on one of the main heterochromatin marks, which, which is H3K27 trimethylation, we observed an increased or of phosphoserine 5 RNA pole 2, which indicates that then uh, there is active transcription in these genes. And we observed that there is a loss of heterochromatin in IPF, but also in associated coding uh, RNAs. But if there is then a loss of the regulation of the MYC complex, then we needed to validate that in the control patients, in the healthy patients, we have a co-localization of the microRNA with the um, proteins that are present in the MYC complex. And indeed, we observe this extensive co-localization in fibroblast from healthy patients, but this co-localization is lost in patients with pulmonary fibrosis. Um, one family of proteins that has similar or similar effects at the chromatin level than the MYC complex is the histone diacetylase protein family. And here with this cartoon, I just want to summarize that in our previous observations, we observed that the MYC complex induced a closed chromatin conformation by adding methyl groups in lysine 27 in histone 3. There is a protein that is actually an epigenetic regulator and is called EP300, is an histone acetyl transferase. And the role of this protein is to add acetyl groups in certain um, histone tails to induce an open chromatin formation. But the proteins that I am mentioning, the histone diacetylases, which I am just including here two of the members of this family, induce the opposite effect than EP300. They will deacetylate these regions to induce a closed chromatin conformation, as we observe for the MYC complex. Then 
we wanted to evaluate the levels of these proteins in patients with pulmonary fibrosis, but remarkably, we detected an increase in the protein levels of these proteins, which then was not explaining the effect at the chromatin level that we were observing. Therefore, we decided to perform functional assays to evaluate the, the nuclear activity um, of this, of this HDAC family. And we observed that the activity in the nucleus at least is reduced in patients with IPF. It means that we have increased levels of these proteins. This is true, but they are inactive. And what is known at the biochemical level is that this protein, HDAC1, can be acetylated and HDAC2 can be phosphorylated, and then they will be inactive. Who is mediating this change in, in the proteins is indeed P300, which is able to acetylate HDAC1, and this will induce the concomitant inactivation of HDAC2. The first step was to validate that HDAC1 is inactive in patients with fibrosis, and for that we perform an assay that is called proximity ligation assay, in which we use two antibodies, HDAC1, and the antibody that recognize the acetyl group. If we detect a signal, it's because the protein is inactive, as we observed in the nucleus of IPF patients, but not in the nucleus of control patients. And if this could be explained then by the activity of P300, we validated using specific antibodies that can recognize the active form of P300 or the inactive form of P300. And we observe that in, in the lungs of uh, fibrosis patients, we have an increase of active P300, which then might explain why we also have inactivation of HDAC1. To validate this, we perform some further chemical uh, assays in which we overexpressed inactive HDAC1 or active HDAC1 by modified by modifying the lysine residues that can be acetylated. And interestingly, we observe that the overexpression of inactive HDAC1 will give us as a signal, a signal that is very similar to patients with IPF uh, because we see the increase on, of, the, of the extracellular matrix proteins. Finally, if after these observations, we decided then to inactivate the protein EP300 by two different methods, by using a overexpression of a constitutive inactive uh, protein, as well as to use pharmacological inhibition of this protein. And in the mouse model of bleomycin, in which we instillate bleomycin intratracheally uh, in these mice, we observe that indeed in mice that have developed the pulmonary fibrosis, upon treatment with EP300 inhibitors, we decreased collagen deposition, we decreased fibrotic uh, proliferation, and we decreased um, several fibrosis hallmarks. Now, is what is happening after the inhibition of P300? We validated that the inhibition of this protein correlates with a rescue of the activity of HDAC1 in the nucleus of the cells of these patients. And just to validate that uh, the molecular model in which the activation of P300 induces the inactivation of HDAC1, after treating these cells with a chemical inhibitor in which we can reduce the levels of fibrotic proteins, if we again express the inactive form of HDAC1, we see again the increase of fibrotic markers. Therefore, our model, I will present to you now, in our molecular model, the, the fibroblast of- Doctora, Doctora Rubio, I'm sorry, your, your time is running out. Okay. I yeah. need one minute more. Yeah. In the pulmonary fibroblast, we have a decrease of midlet 7 d which compromises the activity of the MyC complex. And we saw that this is due to the hyperactivity of P300. While in healthy fibroblast, since we have the presence of the microRNA, the MyC complex is recruited to these areas and induces transcriptional repression. The home take message that I would like to give with this talk is that the integrative analysis 
of the epigenetic factors. In, in this talk, I just talk about two, the DNA methylation and the non-coding RNAs. In different experimental models, in vitro, in vivo or ex vivo, will lead us to a better characterization of biomarkers that consider cellular, tissue, and individual heterogeneity. This, in combination with high throughput sequencing data, will allow us to, to predict low or high, high, high risk to develop a disease. We will be able to, to provide better signature panels for personalized medicine, and finally, um, to generate a more efficient epidrugs and monitor the treatment of these patients. Thank you for your attention. Dr. Rubio, thank you very much for this excellent presentation, as well as to the other speakers for their excellent presence today. We want to thank you all. And in order to continue with our program, we are going to move now to the next stage of the program and open the panel discussion, if you allowed me. I would like to make some questions to the speakers and um, thank you for the, for the audience. First of all, I would like to know what does it mean to work in Germany as a Mexican scientist? Dr. Aron Borgonio, would you like please to answer? Thanks very much. Well, um, working in Germany to me uh, meaning is working hard and working hard to demonstrate that in Mexico, there are a high scientists to working here and with high qualification, but at the same time to be proud here in this country uh, because, uh, because of the amazing infrastructure. And of course, uh, also to make our, um, to able to make interchange cultural. Thank you very much. Now I would like to make the same question to Dr. Marielena Torres Padilla. What does it mean to include Mexico? What does it mean to work in Germany as a Mexican scientist? Please, Dr. Torres. I am. I am not sure I can answer you that question um, in a simple way. Um, I think over the years I have learned that for me science has no borders, and therefore the the nationality is, is has, uh, I sort of have been imprinted by different ways of thinking. And I think probably that could be it. Um, I, for me, really what I have learned over the years, as I said, is science has no borders. Um, however, thinking about the question, my early education in biology at the UNAM was broad, uh, biology, fantastic. That broad kind of knowledge has been a very strong pillar. And my early training in the lab in the Institute of Physiologia Cellular and Biomedicas was, was a very important um, pillar for, for me to come and, and work in Europe. Thank you very much. It means that you became an international scientist. You have lived in several countries in Europe, as your CV says. And uh, well, that's a very nice uh, answer. I would like to know the same uh, the same, I make the same question to Dr. Arubio. What does it mean for you to work in Germany as a Mexican scientist? Uh, for me, um, it's also a difficult question, but I would like to remark indeed that the education that I got from the University of Puebla was, was really robust. So when I came here, of course, we always have different uh, limitations or, or imaginary limitations based on the cultural background or the language. And we all have to overcome these kind of limitations on time. Was it difficult in Germany? It was not at all. So I, I feel very thankful and very lucky to have had on one side a strong education from my own country and on the other side, a country that was open for ideas open for international collaborations. And in this country, I could say I was able to, to practice both ways, the individual, um, um, individual um, science or collaborative science. Because in this country, I found, as Aaron mentioned, a great infrastructure. Here you can get very easy access to high throughput technologies, but 
here I could experience the collaboration that now I can even apply with my country. So is, is that open and is that broad? Thank you very much for your response. I think this is very important for the audience to know about your experiences and your points of view as Mexicans working in Germany. Now, now I would like to ask Dr. Marcel Prax, what does it mean to include Mexico in multi-center studies? So um, at least for our, our study, which I presented, um, the contribution of Mexico was very important in order to cover um, more than uh, only a few countries. So for example, from the America, from America, we only had uh, USA and also participants from Canada, but we also asked, for example, um, as a group from Colombia, whether they can participate, but it was really, really difficult to recruit the labs, which I tried to point it out. And therefore, I was really happy and I'm still, oh, I'm, I'm still happy that we have a really good and great collaboration partners with uh, Mexican scientists and experts in the transfusion field. And that you also helped me, for example, to, to get the connections. And I think it helps really also um, to, to, to build a, really a great network, which can be used also in the future for, I don't know, for the coming projects. So I think it's really great. Thank you very much for your, for your answer. And uh, let's keep working together. You can count with us. We can keep collaborating and making the, 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 the bridges between Germany and Mexico. Thank That's you great. very much. Thank you. Now, I would like to ask all of you, how did the pandemic COVID-19 affect your, your stay in Germany? and your projects in the case of Dr. Marcel Prax. I would like to start with Carla Rubio. I would like to know your opinion about this. Okay, sure. It, well, it was affected in a positive and a negative way, I would say, because in the Max Planck, we didn't stop activities. So of course we could continue working on the bench but the, the, all the meetings were canceled. So now it's only possible to discuss with collaborators by online meetings, and it gives a different feeling. Also the classes take place online. However, what I would mention as a positive aspect is that since uh, the delivery of some consumables was blocked, we cannot do experiments that are, it's not up to us if the reagents will come or not. We started to use and to get more profit from from repositories that contain uh, public data from genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics. And we were able to enrich our current project with this type of uh, in silico meta-analysis. So I would not like to see this only as a negative aspect, but indeed we have to be versatile and flexible to adapt to the changes. This is a very good point of view. Marcel, can you share with us your experience during the pandemic? Of course, yeah. So at least for the presentation I gave, this project was luckily or uh, fortunately finished before the outbreak of the pandemic. But as I mentioned, we have still um, at the moment ongoing projects. And of course, we have some delay here. We also had to adjust here in our institute as we are performing batch release for vaccines. So we are heavily involved in this whole assessment of those new COVID vaccines, for example. And we had to implement a shift system. So uh, part of our co-workers and employees uh, have to stay at home. And of course, this does not accelerate anything here. And also from our study partners, I, I yeah, received some uh, messages that the projects are delayed or postponed also probably to next year. But I think everyone is aware of the situation and yeah, we have to cope with it. And at least that uh, my goal is to finish it as soon as possible. But yeah, I will not make any pressure on, on the others because I know it's a hard time for everyone. So yeah. Okay. We, have, we have to go with it. Of course. Thank you so much. And what about you, Dr. Torres Padilla? Yes, I mean, as Marcel mentioned, I think it has uh, impacted everybody. So I think for us at that every level, I can see we are slower in producing certain work. Paper revisions are taking longer. 
Um, I um, just want to mention that I also have seen a lot of uncertainty on the younger trainees, and I just want to mention to them in particular that I'm very sympathetic about that because there's uncertainty. Um, we have had um, a collaboration with the genomic science program in, in Mexico over the years. Uh, with students coming and spending a year with us, and that has been stopped, for example, which I, I think is, is, is a pity. Um, at the same time, I remain positive because this is a global issue and I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll do better. But um, yeah, we have to remain optimistic that things will get a bit better. Yes, that's a very uh, good position to remain optimistic in these situations. Thank you very much for your opinion. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Aaron Borgoño, would you share with us your well, opinion? Well, I share the same feelings about COVID-19. I think that since COVID-19 is coming here, the science is not the same because although we work in all of the time with the internet of social medias, is, we're missing something. And this social interaction is very important because um, science is uh, work with social, uh, social interaction. And of course, um, the science doesn't work alone and we need industry, we need uh, materials, we need people. And all of them uh, had produced that our projects, they like it. But on the other side, we work alone in that, in that time and we need to work with ourselves. So that's for me a great experience. And of course, um, I work in, um, I continue to work in and um, we need to work in with. Yeah, I appreciate very much your opinion because you are on the clinic and I know that you were attended patients with COVID-19. Yes. And you never stop. No. <laughs> and even though we need to work with uh, the with the efforts and with all of them and to do also with science i know this is a, a an equipment job yes thank you very much and now uh, i have a third question now uh, first i would like to ask dr marcel prax what was in in your experience uh, the working with Mexican colleagues, you already expressed um, about the institutions, but maybe you can express or say your opinion about the Mexican colleagues you met in, in these um, different years uh, working with the Mexican institutions. Um, yes, so I, I started here five years ago at the Institute and I know briefly after I started here, I think one colleague of you, Dr. Bayo, I think he was here at the Institute. He gave also a talk, uh, which was really great. And um, the other experience are that they are very uncomplicated. You know, I have experienced a lot with different sites and different groups. And at least for, for the Mexican colleagues, I had never had any trouble. It's everything works quite smooth. Even the, the shipment of materials to Mexico was without any trouble. So therefore I'm also glad that we have, we can continue our cooperation because it's really, really easy to work with them. And the only thing is, which is a pity is that I had not been able to visit Mexico up to now, but perhaps uh, there is one time a chance also to go there and uh, yeah, to, to meet the colleagues also there because otherwise we met at the ISPT meeting personally, but this is also not possible this year. It's also only a virtual um, conference. And yeah, I hope that when the COVID pandemic is over that we still are, or that we again are able to meet also our colleagues uh, personally. Yes, well, thank you very much for this opinion from Mexican collaborator, collaborators. I started with the Paul Ehrlich Institute about 12 years ago. So I met a lot of people there and I visited it several times with uh, Dr. Thomas Montag that yeah. he passed away, but uh, he, he, he put the first stone in this cooperation. Program. Right, yeah. And uh, I'm glad that you have this opinion from the Mexican colleagues. And we hope to have you in Mexico in yeah. the future. <laughs> Let's hope so. Thank okay. you very much for yeah, your Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And now for, for the other speakers, the last question for all of you is, what would you recommend 
to your Mexican colleagues based on your experience in Germany? To students or colleagues or researchers, what would you recommend them um, based on your experience? We can start with Aaron, please. Yes, well, I recommend um, because of the self, self, uh, same spirit to take the opportunity to work with international groups and to improve our scientific works and to take regular uh, interchanges, not only in Germany, in all the world, and to meet people that work and think different. I think this Thank is you, thank you very much. This is a very nice and uh, rich opinion about your stay in Germany. Maria Elena, would you like to share with us? Yeah, um, I think very simple to come, be very open uh, and very eager to learn from a different way of doing science and thinking. Um, come with full of energy, work hard and show commitment and be commi committed to your, um, to your mission or to whatever it is that you want to achieve. Um, I guess this is applicable to every place that one goes, but um, yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Torres Padilla. And finally, Carla Rubio, would you like to share with us your experience? Well, I agree with, with, my, with the colleagues with these answers. I think Mexicans are really particular in terms of creativity and in, in terms of a dynamic attitude. So I have a great respect for Mexican scientists in Mexico and abroad. So my only suggestion will be to keep doing and, and to move forward, uh, keeping this attitude to being flexible enough to adapt uh, to these restrictions that we have now worldwide. And it, it does not matter where we are doing science as Mexican researchers, we should always keep the science level at the global level. This is very, very important to keep the science level at the global level. I, I like that to, to finish with these questions. And finally, I would like to thank you all to the public, to the audience, to these extraordinary speakers for sharing your time today in this third uh, Mexican Science Day. And we hope to see you next year in the fourth Mexican Science Day in the frame of the Berlin Science Week. We hope you did like this uh, session that was uh, very interesting in many fields, many inst institutions and focus mainly on, on, on health, on research in health. So thank you very much to all of you. Have a nice day and keep uh, sharing with us your results in your very important research. Thank you very much to all of you. Gobierno de México.